So I'm Annie Spindler, Elderflower Care Community. It's a holistic assisted living and memory care homestead. I've been an acupuncturist for 10 years and I'm an adult care administrator. And I'm starting Elderflower. So I'd like to see a raise of hands. Show of hands, how many people have experience with assisted living, nursing homes, family members? Great, yeah, most of us. Keep your hands, raise them high. How many can't wait to move into one? <laughs> so I hope, I hope to change your mind today. As we know, the problem is, um, you know, 50% of nursing home residents are in antidepressants. They are sad, they're lonely, they have to leave loved ones and pets at home. And they're in these large institutions with high um, caregiver, or high resident to caregiver ratios. So one of the biggest problems in this industry is the staffing shortage. The nurses and CNAs are overworked and underpaid, and how can we expect someone to care for someone else if they're not being cared for themselves? A little to no time in nature, standard American diet, which usually comes from a can, it's processed food, which causes <coughs> things like heart disease, diabetes, and symptoms of dementia. Uh, the, I don't want to die here, that's my personal story. So my grandmother was actually in four different nursing homes in the last six years of her life. And I cried every time I went to see her. I remember her saying, I don't want to die here. She didn't feel comfortable enough to feel safe and loved and cared for enough to just let go when she was ready. So that's a really important part to me. So the mission of Elder Flower Care Community is to mentally and physically enrich the lives of our aging population with alternative medicine, time in nature, and a thriving community. The solution is uh, holistic alternative treatments, small scale homes, and uh, which with the low resident to caregiver ratio, so uh, the caregivers also feel like family members as well. A farm setting, so it, it's common to have care farms in Europe, actually, where people with dementia come and live and work, and they have a sense of pride, a sense of purpose and belonging in the community. And this is what I want to represent here. Um, spouses, partners, loved ones, and well-behaved pets are always uh, always welcome. And we're mostly going to have you know homegrown anti-inflammatory diet, which decreases all of those ailments I referred to before. Um, actually decreases dementia symptoms with an anti-inflammatory diet, organic diet. Um, children's programs and adult day services. So there's nothing like a, ch a child to bring joy to the, to the bikes of an elder. So having children constantly there, partnering with other groups and have children's programs every day. The end of life sacred ceremonies. So death in this country is, is feared and we try to avoid it as much as we can, right? So having something, a ceremony, and having the beauty of death and being just part of life and sacred is really important to Elder Flower as well. So um, this includes 24-hour safety and security assistance with daily activities of daily living, washing, dressing, um, meals, transportation, Wellness activities such as acupuncture, chiropractic, massage. Think of it as a wellness retreat for the rest of your life. That's, I think that they deserve that. Um, home health care services also available through a different organization that can come in as the need arises. The nonprofit piece is really important to me because nonprofits to me are a part of the community rather than casting people aside away from the community. So bringing them together to support our elders. Um, we'll also help with um, supplemental assistance, such as if funds run out, they can stay or remain in place. Sliding scale for possibly the day services and the child's programs as well. So we've already started raising funds through crowdfunding, which I'm excited about. And we've also been, we are now under the umbrella of a fiscal sponsor, so we will be able to take Tax deductible donations. So, what I am asking is I'm inviting a partner to come in who has experience with nonprofits. Um, so, 
someone who can do um, grant writing and fundraising. Also together, then we will find a property that can accommodate seven residents a couple acres. And I'm looking to increase my board and my volunteer database. Um, any wellness practitioners also, please reach out. Uh, I'd love to partner with people in the community that are interested in geriatric care and also wellness. So this is phase one. Uh, my big dreams are seeing it all over the country and make possibly even you know, 10 acres, full farm, and lots of tiny homes for elders as well. Okay, so I'd like to ask one more time, show of hands, if you had to be in assisted living at some point in your life, who's excited about an option like Elderflower? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. One, to see if that we're a good fit for them, but also to see if make sure that they're a good fit for us. Um, so I have a question. So it's always interesting, this whole labor cost thing with assisted living, because as soon as you find out, frankly, these people are not making a living wage, everybody screams, cries, it's horrible. <laughs> the problem, on the other hand, is that if you look from the business side, I mean, labor cost is brutal for something like this, because you're talking about 24-7, you're talking about skill, some kind of skill, employees. Yeah. So are you doing something to somehow disrupt that cost, make this more efficient so that you can actually have less people and then pay them more? Like what are you doing to actually make it so you can't afford them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and that's all, we're all asking that same question, right? <laughs> in every industry. Um, in this scenario, the nurses and the the CNAs, they would prefer a home like this because then they don't have to take care of 15 people at once. So they, I attract the employees that way um, and then offer a standard um, living wage on top of that. But then how do you, but that's the thing is how do you, how do you actually afford that? Like, because I, if they're already doing it, I see why they would want to work over this over assisted living home. Right. But like, again, when you talk about actual living wages, like, what are you doing so that you can actually afford like, a living, living wage? Here's about $60,000 a year. Right, yeah. Well, when I, uh, the $7,000 a month and then plus the nonprofit <coughs> funds also will help to increase that and give me kind of an upfront on offering way 
changes that are appropriate. Um, but yeah, small scale does include lower costs and lower revenue, but then the smaller community is, like I said, it attracts different people in a different way. And so when I did when I did crunch the numbers, I can pay people the standard rate, but also have a smaller scale. Tell me. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, my mother has Alzheimer's, and uh, she got this really great insurance a long time ago that they don't sell anymore because I'm realizing it's too good. <laughs> is what if um, it's something that could be unavoidable for me, could I, like, getting a burial plot, could I prepay and <laughs> get a spot for me in the future there? That's a great question. Um, yeah, we will be partnering with long-term care insurance. That's going to be uh, private pay and long-term care insurance are going to be the most that we accept, that we take. Um, we'll have to talk about that next question. <laughs> we'll be in touch. So thanks. Um, did I hear you right? They're going to raise eight thousand, and you're looking to charge seven thousand. Yes. Okay. I think you answered a little of uh, what I'm going to ask by saying you're raising nonprofit funds. But I, I still, I consistently see new businesses underpriced, thinking they're paying the price instead of value. Mm -hmm. So everybody in this room raised their hand to grab your service. So I'm curious why you're not charging more than others providing a lesser service? Mm -hmm. I don't believe that we that we need to take, make a profit off of the elderly. I believe that it should be as affordable as possible. And so that's part of my goal. Yes, I will have additional funds through the nonprofit to keep me alive, for sure. <laughs> so that's not a two-pointed question. How much, I think, what, what's your, like your total income that you're shooting for per person? It's not 7,000. You're looking to bring in nine, like 2,000 person in nonprofit. I'm just curious how you're going to make the numbers to work to the, to the pay point. Right. Um, right now, it looks to be about seven, and I will see in terms of the future and how, how it happens of how much I actually need to raise. All right. Thanks. Sure. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. I was kind of digging down there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi, Annie. Hello. Hi. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, my in-laws are in a precarious position, as so many other people in the room, that are looking at assisted living facilities and still making a choice to be at home and suffer through. I'm just curious, um, have you put together your business plan far enough to know how much or how many people will be on your staff and what does that look like? What's the breakdown of the staff? Um, in the facility. I have, yeah, I have, um, do you want to know right now? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, an executive director, um, a chef, a uh, grounds person, five CNAs or um, helpers, partner, you know, um, personal care assistants, which actually are less than the, the wage of a nurse. Um, one nurse and then also having on-call doctors, um, partnering with chiropractors, acupuncturists, other services as well, but they won't be full-time on staff. And you feel like that would be a good ratio for seven residents? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the, the CNAs will also be med techs so they can distribute the medication as needed, and then the other helpers will also do the cleaning and other services as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I'm, uh, I, I think it's amazing you're, you're, you're going down this road. In February 2020, I had a good friend that took over uh, a business of assisted living in nursing homes, about 200 some, um, and that uh, take care of thousands. And that happened to another friend that also runs one. And, um, to me, it seems like the business is broken, and I'm not even talking about the location, but trying to see how these companies can actually keep the lights on. Um, obviously, going into COVID, um, the amount of regulation that, that is in, in a lot of states, and I'm not even sure what North Carolina is ever going to do. So I'm, I'm curious, if, if, if you go, and I know you have a, a very altruistic vision to help, but I'm, I'm so curious, kind of going to the labor question in terms of uh, staff 
having the pain, staff staff are not showing up, staff are you know, ready for the next job immediately. Um, you know, how are you going to fix this? What is a very broken model? And you're talking about very big companies that are at this point ready to say it ain't worth it, which is which is crazy. We have to get, get, take care of our elderly people. So it's a very broken model right now, systemic across the United States. And I'm very curious if you approach the business side of it, where forget the care for side. How can you actually, you know, make this a sustainable business? Um, like I heard you say, one nurse, well, one nurse who, who quits, or one nurse who has has to deal with his or her own medical emergency or whatever it may be. That could be another pandemic. But um, I'm, I'm curious how you analyze that, and do we have any unique ways of tackling the business model? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I have a mentor in the area, and she has a 12 bed. Facility, and she often runs into a lot of those those issues. So she ends up having to do a lot of the work herself. And um, I think part of that is the nature of running a small business. It is going to be small. I don't imagine being big. But if I have multiple locations, then I can also support myself through that and having different small scale houses around an area. Um, part of the nonprofit, though, too, and part of being a part of the community, I think encourages people to be around and be supporting the business as well. So in terms of giving their time, having volunteers, you know, have a, a large volunteer database constantly that a lot of the other assisted living places that are for profit don't have. Um, but that, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Hey, Annie. Hi. Um, so first, I just wanted to take a moment and acknowledge uh, your grandmother's piece in your story and how wonderful, wonderfully deep uh, your mission is. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with elder care communities, so I was wondering if you could take a moment and just explain the different types of programs out there and how Elder Bauer is related to them and interconnected and how you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, the, so they have three levels, typically independent, assisted living, and then skilled nursing. And a lot of places, particularly in this area, that's called continual care resident, um, continual care retirement communities, where people can stay and live throughout their life, but they actually have to move three times because of the nature of the different buildings and things that they have. So at Alder Flower, one of my missions is to have a place where they can stay and the care changes with them as they grow. So they'll move one time, spend the rest of their lives there, and not have to move again. Hi, I'm Michelle Alvarez. Um, so, in thinking about making this beautiful vision come true, uh, rightfully so, people are wondering how the money would work out. And so, for what it's worth, um, it's so inspiring. I'm a geriatric psychologist, and if I had an opportunity, I've, I've worked in nursing homes, I grew up in nursing homes. I've and uh, frankly, I stopped doing the work because of Medicare. <clears throat> it would, I would make more money volunteering my time at a place like this than trying to work with Medicare. So, but one person will show. <laughs> <laughs> I love this as well, and my personal connection with uh, both of my parents that did not have any Alzheimer's or any dementia uh, is a story in itself. And um, I would like to call out just a, the money part of it. So my experience, and this was in the Washington DC area, is that you could get a really great um, three-tier, lovely assisted living for about 5,000 a month. And then the next level was 10,000, which was really cool. Like mm -hmm. a pool. Yeah. Tell my mom when she found out someplace else at a pool. <laughs> and she didn't have dementia. She was pissed. <laughs> but it wasn't going to change. So um, my point is 7,000. So I'm just going to say it's a mindset. And I encourage you to embrace the value of this and where it fits into the economic. Demographic because you can always back off. You can always, I mean, you're going to, if you have, if you have a way to, if you have so much funding. So, in other words, don't hesitate to charge 10000 because 7000 in my mind, 
is halfway between, I might not have been a candidate because I was at the 5,000 mark, right? I know, I mean, because when you're going into this, it was a financial decision for me as well as for them. And if you're halfway in between, why not shoot for that much more per person? That doesn't mean you have to do it, but that growth in the mindset of not fearing to ask for that, rather than, you know, how many people will show up for free? I mean, they're, too, they're both important, right? But balancing that um, is really critical because money will be the biggest thing. And I can tell you that when elders that really need the physical help <coughs> that are totally still thinking they're 19 in their head, maybe more than when they were 19, uh, that's a challenge in itself and it's, it's expensive. Yeah, luckily I do have that wiggle room. So if I start at seven and realize I need to go to eight, you know, I, I'm still way under market value. So I'd just like to really commend you for what you're doing. I try to get here every week and I bring my mom, she's 94, and she still lives by herself a little mile apart. And I always assure her that she will never end up in an assisted living facility. <laughs> All those things that you're creating, I make sure are part of her life every day. Um, that's why I bring her here because it stimulates her. She sees what's happening in the community and what people are doing younger than her. And I had no idea that this was what we were talking about today. Um, uh, aging is not something that is comfortable for most of us to look at or think about. We're all going to end up in a position where if we're lucky enough to have a child like me, <laughs> Some people come just end of life, you know, the last six months, and some people come. 